It's great to be with you this morning. What I want to talk to you about this morning is Obamacare. After all these years and all these challenges, Obamacare is still lurking around, but there's a fascinating court case at the United States Supreme Court up there right now. It's going to be argued next month. That is, I think, the most serious threat to Obamacare yet, and I want to tell you a little bit about that case. I'm involved in a tangential way. I don't represent a party in the case, uh, but my nonprofit organization called Missouri Liberty Project filed a brief in the case informing the court about we, what we here in the state of Missouri have chosen to do with regard to the Obamacare exchanges, namely not participate, and uh, informing the court about our choice here in Missouri and urging them to respect our decision. So I'll tell you more about that. But let me just set up a thing or two about this, this case which is called King versus Burwell and why it's so significant. And you know, this will really, I hope, give you sort of the inside track because this is a case that is hugely significant, but the news media, partly because it's a tad complicated, there's some legalese involved, but the news media has really not cottoned onto this case. I think they do not yet understand its significance because the truth of the matter is that if the United States Supreme Court rules the way they ought to rule and upholds the rule of law, enforces the law as it's actually written, this case could effectively end Obamacare in 34 states. And if Obamacare and its mandate ceases to operate for all intents and purposes in 34 states, it is not going to last long as a going concern nationwide. So believe me, our friends on the left do know this. They are trying to influence media opinion, elite opinion right now. And I'm sure they will work even harder as the case moves towards oral argument. But I predict you're going to be hearing a lot about this case soon because after the court hears argument, I suspect that the, our friends in the, uh, in the left-wing media who are a little bit slower on the uptake will realize how significant it is and we'll start hearing more about it. So let me tell you a, a thing or two about it today. And I want to begin by taking us back to the time when the Affordable Care Act was being proposed and debated, that very dark period back in 2009 in our nation's history. Uh, when this bill was before, this huge bill was before Congress. And you might remember that a number of interesting things happened uh, in that two, during that 2009 debate. In the special election in the fall of 2009 in Massachusetts, Senator Scott Brown, Republican Scott Brown, won that election to fill the seat vacated by the death of Senator Ted Kennedy. And this took away the Democrats' supermajority in the United States Senate. You might remember President Obama chillingly, alarmingly, came to office with 60 secure votes in the United States Senate. Senator Scott Brown's election in the fall of 2009 as the Affordable Care Act, or as I'd like to call it, the Unaffordable Care Act, as it was being debated, took away the Democrats' supermajority. And I want to start our story right around there because that event turns out to really matter for the way the Affordable Care Act was actually written in relevant part. And here's why. A number of Democrats in the United States Senate, Ben Nelson is another one, Ben Nelson, you remember, uh, the, uh, of Nebraska, who famously extracted a, a hefty amount of pork in exchange for his support for the ACA. Ben Nelson, Maria Cantwell, and then with the election of Scott Brown, a number of Democrat senators who turned out to be the key swing voters in the United States Senate were supportive in principle of the Affordable Care Act, but deeply concerned that it would be portrayed and would in fact operate as a national takeover of health care. Maria Cantwell, Ben Nelson were among them. And with the loss of the Scott Brown seat or the Ted Kennedy seat to Republican hands, these median Democrats and then these uh, sort of center left Republicans, their votes became absolutely critical uh, in order to break a Senate filibuster. So what happened? Partly as a compromise in order to keep these concerned, these sort of moderate Democrats on board who would have to stand for election in reddish states, the Senate leadership decided that they would make some changes to the bill. And here's some key changes they made. These senators, as I said, were very worried. These median Democrat senators were very worried that this would be portrayed as a national takeover of health care. So one of the things they proposed was to have insurance bought and sold not on a national exchange but on state health care exchanges and moreover these senators wanted the states the individual 50 states to actually run the health care exchanges 
which would be the places under Obamacare where insurance, both government insurance and private insurance, is to be bought and sold. So what Nelson and his other allies in the Senate requested was a provision in the bill that said that states would be the ones to establish the exchanges and states would be the ones to run the exchanges. And they thought this would make the Affordable Care Act more palatable to voters like us here in Missouri who might otherwise be very worried again about a national takeover but would think well heck if Missouri's the entity running the exchange then maybe it's really you know maybe there it, it's really empowering states after all maybe it's not a national takeover you know maybe states are retaining their traditional prerogatives in health care so this is what this group of senators hoped for they hoped that by turning the affordable care act into kind of a federalism type bill they could build public support and of course also uh, get themselves reelected, not face significant uh, reelection issues. So the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, when it came to these exchanges where health care was to be bought and sold, it was rewritten at this critical juncture to include provisions that said that states would be the ones to set up the exchanges and states would run the exchanges. Now here's the only thing. The United States Supreme Court has been very clear for many years now that the federal government cannot tell states what to do and use states to carry out the federal government's programs. There's an important Supreme Court case called United States versus Prince that says that the federal government cannot commandeer state resources in that way. Now, if the federal government has authority under the Constitution to regulate, they can do that. But if it's, if it's an, an issue like this, where the federal government has its own program and they want the states to administer it, they can't just commandeer the states. They can only offer the states incentives. They can say, we would like you to do this, and we will pay you if you do, or we will withhold funding if you do not, right? This is very familiar. How does the federal government get states to change their highway laws, for instance, speed limit laws and so forth? They withhold funding. How, do, how does the federal government, uh, how do they get the states all at one time to set the drinking age at a certain level? They threaten to withhold funding, right? This is very, very common where the government asks the states to do something and then either incentivizes them or threatens them if they do not do it. Well, the government now wanted the Senate Democrats and the administration, which signed off on this change, decided they wanted the states to run the exchanges, set them up and run them, but they knew they couldn't order the states to do so. They didn't have any authority to do that. So instead, they decided to offer the states incentives to use this usual, to pursue this usual course of offering incentives and making threats. So they offered an incentive and they made a threat to the states to run these exchanges, these state-based exchanges. And here was the incentive. The federal government said, if you, Missouri, and every other state, will set up a health care exchange, an Obamacare exchange in your state, and you will allow, and you'll run it, you set it up and you run it, then we, the federal government, among other things, we will provide billions of dollars in premium assistance, as it's called, insurance subsidies. We'll provide billions of dollars in subsidies to people in your state to buy health insurance on the exchanges. So as you may know, if you, the Affordable Care Act, of course, requires everyone to purchase health insurance. That's the individual mandate. It requires every business with 50 or more employees to pay for health insurance. Obamacare approved health insurance. For their employees, that's the employer mandate. So those are the twin mandates that are the keys of the Obamacare system. But if you make below a certain specified level, your income is below a certain specified level, you qualify for subsidies, for premium assistance from the federal government. That's also in the bill, in the law. And what the, Obamacare, uh, what the Obama administration decided to do was they said, look, we'll say to the states, we are going, we'll provide that premium assistance to your state citizens if you set up an exchange. If you don't set up an exchange, though, we'll withhold the premium assistance. Your citizens won't be able to get federal subsidies to buy insurance uh, and, to, and to use it uh, on the exchanges. So states, please set up exchanges. If you don't do it, we're going to withhold this federal premium assistance. Now, there's another provision in the bill that says if states like Missouri decide not to set up an exchange, the federal government can do it anyway, right? So the federal government can and has set up a federal exchange here in the state of Missouri, despite the fact that we voted no on it. The bill allows the government to do it anyway. But the key thing is, is that it appears, and this gets us to what our case is about, what this case is about. The way the bill is written, it looks as if, if the federal government sets up the exchange instead of the states, the premium assistance isn't available. 
Again, because that was supposed to be an incentive to the states. If you set it up, we'll subsidize your citizens. If you don't set it up, we won't subsidize your citizens. So this was the, this is sometimes called cooperative federalism, this kind of bill, and this is the way the bill was written in the fall of 2009 in order to push the thing through the United States Senate and to satisfy both these liberal Republicans and then these moderate, so-called moderate Democrats uh, who were the swing, the key uh, uh, anti-filibuster votes. And this is how the bill ultimately went into effect. Well, here is the only problem for the Obama administration that they did not bank on. And that is, given the choice as to whether or not to set up state exchanges, the state of Missouri said no, and 33 other states said no. So much to their surprise, 34 states in the nation decided not to set up an exchange through one means or another. In Missouri, we of course had a vote. I mean, we actually had a statewide referendum. You probably remember voting. It wasn't that long ago, 2012, we had a statewide referendum. We had to do it because uh, Governor Nixon was threatening to set up the exchange using an executive order. He said he was just going to do it. You know, forget what the, he wasn't going to listen to the legislature withheld funds or told him he couldn't do it. He was going to ignore him and do it anyway by executive order. So we had a referendum and we voted no by over 60%. Missouri citizens said, no, no, we don't, we don't want to set up an exchange. And as I say, 33 other states made the same decision. Well, this came as a very unwelcome development for the Obama administration, who apparently never imagined that any state, let alone 34 states, would forego billions of dollars in insurance subsidies and say no to their exchanges. And so in order to fix this little problem, the Obama administration issued a rule. Right? This is their favorite solution to problems with laws or to inconvenient laws. It's basically their solution to law. You know? If there's a law they don't like, then they just either ignore it or issue rules that completely change it without congressional authorization. So that's what they did in this case. The Obama administration issued an interpretive rule, a quote-unquote interpretive rule, that said, you know what, <clears throat> we've changed our minds, essentially, and it doesn't matter if a state sets up an exchange or not we're going to spend federal money and make premium assistance available in the states anyway. Now you might ask yourself, well what's their incentive? Why would they do that? I mean, why would they particularly, why is the federal government, why does the Obama administration have an incentive? If they can already set up the exchanges under the law using federal power, which they can, so remember if the states don't do it, the law allows the federal government to do it. You know, so the states have turned down their bargain, but who cares? They can set up exchanges anyway, right? Well, here's the reason they care. Because another provision of this bill makes the individual mandate and the employer mandate dependent on the availability of, of insurance subsidies in a state. I'll say that one more time. The individual mandate and the employer mandate is dependent on the availability of premium assistance or insurance subsidies in a state, which means this, under the Affordable Care Act, as it is written, if federal subsidies are not available to be spent in a state, those mandates don't take effect in that state. The individual mandate and the employer mandate don't take effect. No premium assistance, no mandates. Now this is why you begin to see the Obama administration was so alarmed when 34 states said they didn't want the subsidies and they weren't going to set up exchanges. Because if the law was applied as it was written, that would mean in 34 states the individual mandate and the employer mandate wouldn't go into effect. Which would mean in those 34 states, as I hinted at the beginning, in those 34 states Obamacare as we know it basically would cease to operate. And that to them was a totally unacceptable outcome, of course. So they issued this rule. So they made up this rule and said, well, regardless of what states like Missouri do, we're going to spend the federal money in those states anyway, and we're going to enforce the individual and employer mandates in those states anyway. And that's what this lawsuit is about. This lawsuit comes from the state of Virginia, which is one of the states that elected not to set up an exchange. It's a citizen suit from the state of Virginia. And this suit challenges that rule, that so-called interpretive rule, and says, look, that's not what the law says. And you can't just change the law with an interpretive rule or an executive order. And it asks the Supreme Court to enforce the law as written. So here's where we get to the, the slightly technical legal part. And I'll try and uh, put this into, into English and not legalese. The key question in the case is, what does it mean when the law says there has to be a state-established exchange? That's what the Affordable Care Act says. 
there must be the states can establish exchanges and premium assistance is only available on a quote state established exchange in quote now what the federal government is arguing and has been frantically arguing because there are now numerous challenges uh, to on this exact question in multiple states and courts what the federal government has been arguing is that state established exchange just means any exchange established by any, any entity in a state. In other words, their argument is if the federal government sets up an exchange in a state, that's a state established exchange. Right? So if it's an exchange and it's in a state, it's a state exchange. That's the government's argument. In other words, the government's argument is all that federalism talk, all that federalism stuff that Nelson and others extracted as part of the deal for the bill, it doesn't really have any effect. You know, it's, it's in there, but it doesn't really mean what it says it means. It, it doesn't really have any effect at the end of the day. And what the plaintiff, the petitioner, King, is arguing, and what, uh, what my group has argued in our brief, is that this is a very bad reading of the law, number one. Number two, Allowing the administration to change the law in this way seriously threatens the separation of powers. And number three, it disrespects the democratic process in the states. So I'll just say a word about each of those things. And then uh, I'll conclude and I'll, I'll take your questions. Uh, the first thing, it, it is not actually what the law says. The law is actually pretty clear. It defines what a state established exchange means. And it defines it in contrast to a federally established exchange. Right, so one more time, in the state of Missouri, in every other state, if we vote no on an exchange, the federal government can still set one up, but the act refers to that as a federally established exchange. It uses the term state established exchange to refer to when states themselves decide to set up and run exchanges. Right, pretty, pretty clear, as you would expect. The bill is pretty consistent. The law is pretty consistent about that throughout. So just as a matter of statutory interpretation, just interpreting legislation, the government's interpretation is, is pretty far afield. It's really quite a stretch. So our first argument has been, this is just not good. What lawyers do every day, interpret statutes. It's our, it's our bread and butter. This is just not good statutory interpretation. It's just not how this bill was written. It doesn't make good sense of the legislative history. It completely ignores the cooperative federalism provisions that were necessary to pass the bill. It basically reads them right out of the bill. If you look back at even what administration, the administration's own architects, like the Gruber, you know, you've no doubt seen him in the news and what he said about, uh, besides his total contempt for the American people and for people in states like Missouri, you know, Gruber, I think it's John Gruber, is that his name? John Gruber has, has said repeatedly, Jonathan, right, thank you, Bob. Jonathan, I, would, I don't want to offend him. Um, I'm sure he's much smarter than I am as, as, and everyone else in America. But Jonathan Gruber uh, has said repeatedly, unfortunately for the administration, that this, this was not a glitch, this feature of the bill. He's confirmed what the legislative history makes clear, which is that this was part of the deal on the bill. This was necessary for the bill to craft the state exchanges to work in this way. I mean, that, that was, it was an incentive disincentive structure I and mean, that was deliberate and this is this is what's so damning about Jonathan Gruber's statements besides the fact that he's such a jerk but Gruber has also made clear that the administration knew that the bill was written in this way in order to get it through Congress and they understood that they signed off on it it was designed that way so our first argument is this is how the bill was designed this is how the bill is written the administration's new interpretation really changes the bill rather than interpreting it. It's just not very plausible. And the second thing, however, is, is that the administration's position here really is a threat to the separation of powers. And this is a consistent, as you well know, a consistent problem with this administration, whether it's immigration or whether it's the Affordable Care Act or whether it's some other law. If the president decides he doesn't like a law, he has a nasty habit now of either issuing an executive order that just changes it or of not enforcing it, which is what he's done with various pieces of federal legislation, uh, or in this case, issuing an interpretive rule that essentially changes the face of the act. You might remember the president suspended uh, various timing provisions in the bill when the employer mandate went into effect. He just changed it automatically. You know, that's written in the bill. Or I should say unilaterally, not automatically, unilaterally. That date, the effect date, that was actually in the, in the law that Congress passed. The president has no discretion under the law to change it, and as you might remember, he just changed it. You know, he just said, oh, I'm just going to change it, and just did. 
It just changed written law. He's essentially trying to do something like this, we argue, with this interpretive rule. The president does have authority, or his administration has authority, to issue interpretive rules to carry legislation into effect. That's a common thing. But you can't just issue any rule. What the Constitution says and what the Supreme Court has said is that you can only issue interpretive rules when you have been granted discretion by Congress to do so. And Congress didn't grant him any discretion here. Again, these provisions are clear. So the president's attempt to change the law is not only bad interpretation, it really is a power grab, yet another power grab by his office, by the White House, over the legislature and ultimately an attempt to grab it from the courts as well. And it's absolutely vital, both for our constitutional balance of powers right now and in the future, to say to the president, you're not allowed to do this. You are not allowed to change the text of laws by just issuing rules that nobody votes on but you. You're not permitted to do so. So the separation of powers is a significant concern. And finally, the last thing is, and this is what we devoted the bulk of our brief to at the Supreme Court. The states have been asked under this law, under Obamacare, somewhat ironically, the states were asked to carry on a democratic process and to decide do they want to participate in exchanges or not. And 34 states did that, and through one means or another said they did not want to carry, that they did not want to participate. And again, in states like Missouri, we actually held a statewide democratic referendum. So states and state citizens, millions of us, have been asked to participate and to render a verdict one way or another. We said no, and now the administration is asking the Supreme Court to essentially make our judgment meaningless, just to nullify it and to say, well, it, it doesn't matter. We're just going to go right on ahead as if Missouri had voted yes. And so we've asked the Supreme Court not to allow this to happen and to remember that our system of federalism is a vital, vital part of our Constitution. It's one of the most unique features of our Constitution. And when con Congress cannot commandeer states and state resources, Congress has to ask states to participate. When states say no, they don't want to participate, they want to turn down the incentives to do so, those decisions should be honored. And so we've asked this, we've reminded the Supreme Court about our experience here in Missouri and then in the 33 other states, and we've asked them to honor that. Here's my closing thought, and then I'm happy to take your questions. The irony of this is what the petitioner in this case and what our group in this case is asking the Supreme Court to do is just to enforce Obamacare as it's written. The administration wants to change its own law. He could write the law however he wanted it, President Obama. This is how he wrote the law in order to get it through, to get support from his own party. This is how he wrote the law. So he should have to follow the law that he wrote. And the irony is, if that he has to follow the law as he wrote it, the law will probably collapse because he didn't write it very well. And because the people of the United States really don't want to go along with it. I mean, you think about it. Voters in 50 states were asked if they wanted to participate or not, and voters in 34 said no. That just shows you that this law remains deeply unpopular, and the American people don't like it. And as a consequence, if the law is enforced as it's written, it would be on the verge of collapse. That's not a bad thing. That's democracy, right? That's democracy. And so I personally am hoping and longing for an opinion by the Supreme Court and I would love to see an opinion by the Chief Justice of the United States, because I think he has a little redemption to do in this area. <laughs> an opinion by the Chief Justice that says, you know what? We were asked a few years ago to strike down Obamacare and we didn't do it. We've been asked now to essentially ignore Obamacare, but we're not going to do it. We're just going to enforce the law as it's written. We're just going to uphold the law as it's written. And by doing so, they would strike a death knell for Obamacare as a whole nationwide. I would love to see that opinion. I think we've got a good shot at it, and we'll find out in just a few months. We'll find out in June. I'll stop there, and I'll take your questions. The thing about a lot of these separation of powers provisions um, is that the, the Supreme Court is traditionally reluctant to intervene to enforce them. What they usually say is, well, the political branches have powers to enforce them among themselves. You know, so to, this is called, at the, at the court, this is called the political question doctrine, which is just that, well, you know, look, if it's a fight between the executive and Congress, and Congress says the executive is, is, is trampling its powers, and the executive says Congress is, those two branches ought to fight it out. They, they can, you know, they can punish each other, they can withhold funding, they can veto bill, let them do it. We're not going to get into it. 
So the short answer, I think, to your question is, I think it's a good argument. Uh, I suspect it's the kind of argument that courts would uh, try and stay out of just because they traditionally have. So, um, you know, I, Obamacare is a many-headed monster, um, but the thing is, and of course, what we, I always say this, and I continue to believe it, what we need ultimately in Obamacare is a political solution, and I think we all know that. Right? We have got to elect a different president, or Mickey Progress electing a different Congress, and we ultimately we have to repeal the thing. So this uh, trying to kill it by actually help make enforcing its terms is necessary and important for all the reasons I just said. But at the end of the day, the ultimate solution is uh, we, have, we have got to change it politically. We've got to repeal the thing and replace it politically. It, will the case be close? Yes, it will be close. One of the, it, it will be, my, I suspect it will be 5-4 one way or another. So it's just a question of which 5-4 we get. I suspect. Um, why will it be close? Well, besides the fact that the administration, it, you know, politics, I mean, the administration is already arguing that the Supreme Court will overstep its role if it strikes down the president's signature domestic achievement, which is a ridiculous legal argument. But they made it to great effect a few years ago in the in the Sebelius case, and they'll make it again here now. There's that. There's also the fact that uh, the fact that um, agencies that are empowered to carry out laws, in this case, the Department of Health and Human Services, under uh, under American constitutional law, they are given some deference in interpreting the statutes they enforce. So what the administration is saying here is, we deserve deference. We came up with this rule. We're enforcing it. We deserve deference. Now the court, the Supreme Court has been very clear, deference doesn't mean we just allow you to do whatever you want. You can't issue, again, you can't issue rules that have nothing to do with the statute you're interpreting. You know, we actually have to ask for a fit between your rule and the statute. And our argument here is in this case, there just isn't that fit between the rule and the statute. But that's going to be the ball game right there. Does the agency, in this case Health and Human Services, do they get any deference or is their rule so far outside the text that the court's going to say, no, you don't get it. I know there will be four justices, at least, who will say, oh, the agency should certainly get deference in this case. And those will be Ginsburg, Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. I mean, I would be stunned if one of those justices voted a different way. And the real question is, how will the Chief Justice and Justice Kennedy vote? And then that brings me to your second question, which is, you're quite right. You know, the Supreme Court did not, the Supreme Court never has to take any case uh, except for lawsuits to, between states and then a couple other classes of lawsuits that are, that are very rare. Those are the only cases under the Constitution the Supreme Court has to take. Every other case is discretionary. The court can take it or not. Now, having said that, when there is a significant federal law at issue and when lower federal courts are in disagreement about that law, the Supreme Court usually takes the case. But here's the interesting thing about this case. At the time the Supreme Court granted this case, there was no disagreement in the lower federal courts. The lower federal courts had, had not disagreed over the interpretation of this rule, and the Supreme Court reached out and took this case anyway. And in fact, my organization filed a brief at what's known as the, the certiorari stage, that's the please take it stage, and we tried to convince the court they should go ahead and take this case anyway, despite the fact that the lower federal courts hadn't disagreed. I will tell you, when we filed our brief at that stage, at the please take it stage, I thought it was a long shot. And I said to some friends who I worked on the brief with, I said, you know, I think this is a long shot because it's so politically charged, I think the court will just duck this because they don't have to take it. And to my surprise and delight, they did decide to take it. Now what does that tell me? It tells me that there's a significant contingent within inside the court, or within the court, that is deeply troubled by what the administration has done here and wants to strike it down. And you need at least four votes to grant a case, four out of nine at the Supreme Court. Um, I'm just guessing here, I rather doubt that the Chief Justice voted to take this case in the first instance. So if I had to guess, I would guess that it was a Justice Kennedy who voted with the other three conservatives to take this case. If that is true, that is very, very, very good news. So we would then have four already going in and we just need one which would be the Chief Justice. And I, you know, I, I think he's, I think and hope that he'll do the right thing here. The lower federal court has, has looked at this issue and has said that there, there's not a standing problem that would prevent the case from going forward, that of the various uh, petitioners involved in the case, you know, uh, there's, there's numerous of them. David King is the lead petitioner and that at least David King has standing and that's enough. 
I would be surprised, I, I'm not surprised the left is making this argument, I'd be pretty surprised if the Supreme Court decides to kick out the case on that basis. Just because um, the court has become very, very careful about standing problems uh, recently, even more careful than normal, and they really hate granting a case and then having to dismiss it later because they don't. Standing, by the way, uh, for those of you who uh, have not ruined your mind with the law, standing means basically that you've got a, a plaintiff or you've got a, you've got a person who can sue who has the ability to sue. You know, so in federal court, we actually have pretty strict rules about who can bring lawsuits and who not. And standing just means you are in the right place to bring a lawsuit. So I don't, I don't think, I think that danger is relatively remote that it would be dismissed on standing grounds. Yeah, if, and so long as one is, then it's fine. You know, I mean, and, and that's, uh, that's what the lower federal court said in this, in this very case. Uh, the lower court said that at least, and I believe it was King, at least David King definitely has standing and therefore no need to reach the question this case can go forward. So um, now, might the dissenters, if, if it's 5-4 and the liberals lose the case, might the dissenters, you know, howl about standing? Uh, maybe, maybe. But I would, I would be a little surprised. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I would be a little surprised if, uh, standing, if there was a standing problem at this point that made them get rid of it. Yeah, states can sue. I mean, that's another one. States can sue. And actually, the, if you look over the last you know, six years, or whatever it's been now of the Obama administration, the most effective centers of resistance to the Obama administration have been, have been states. You know, who brought the first individual mandate case? States did. Um, who are driving this case? You know, even though it's an individual plaintiff, it's David King, who's, whose name is at the front uh, on this case, there are multiple of these challenges going on, and most of them were brought by states. States like Missouri that have elected not to set up exchanges and now are being effectively forced to do so, and either their governors or their state attorneys general have brought suits and said, no, we, we didn't want to do that. So st states can resist. Now, Missouri hasn't been because we have, st why? right, we know why, because we have state officials who you know, are in hock with the Obama administration. So our governor and our attorney general have, have been. One of the reasons, incidentally, we filed our brief, I keep pointing to it, here's what it looks like. Green brief, by the way, did you know that all the briefs of the Supreme Court all are assigned colors? It's like preschool, and you, and you have to get the right, if you don't have the right color on your brief, you don't get to file it, they throw it away. So our brief had to be a light green. So here's our light green brief. And uh, one of the reasons we filed this brief is because uh, there was nobody else who was, None of our state officials, our state, statewide officials, uh, were defending our choice here in Missouri not to join the exchange. And so, we, since we thought about it so hard in the state and went to a lot of trouble and spent a lot of money having a referendum, we wanted the Supreme Court to know about that. So states can do it, um, Bob. And then the other thing is uh, political warfare. I mean, I think Senator Blunt, if I remember correctly, uh, has introduced a bill that would cut off funding for President Obama's immigration enforcement because he's attempted to completely, ch there's another egregious violation, he's attempted to completely change our immigration law substantively by executive order. It's the most unbelievable power grab in immigration law ever in American history. I mean, it's really, it's worthy of like Andrew Jackson. I mean, it's really something, just blatant power grab. And so Congress can just cut off funding. They're, they're certainly allowed to do that. But other than that kind of political warfare, lawsuits, funding, um, you know, it's, it's tough, as you say. It's hard. The ultimate solution is a, an election. I, I think the first thing that would happen is the executive would be significantly empowered to rewrite laws that it doesn't like with outlandish interpretations. So I, I mentioned that deference, you know, the, it, the agents, agencies, federal agencies are due some deference in interpreting the law. I think the deference would dramatically expand in effect. You know, so if, if the Obama administration, if this is a valid interpretation of this law that changes a fundamental pr provision, then we would see a significant movement, further movement towards the executive in terms of power and the laws. And again, what's alarming about that is this administration has done it and gotten by with it so many times already. And that's bad enough, but to actually have a court case that sets a precedent for it is, is, is very, very detrimental and harmful. So I think that would be the first thing. 
Um, would federalism be weakened? Yes, absolutely. Because essentially what would happen is Congress can say that it's incentivizing the states to do one thing and then basically command them to do it or just override their decisions. And that precedent would stand. And Congress would realize, well, it looks as if we can do this you know, without any consequence. So uh, federalism would be further weakened as well. I mean, it's really, it, it's the fundamentals of our constitutional system, separation of powers, federalism at stake in this case, and then not to mention just good healthcare policy. Uh, so it's really quite serious. That's right. If, if, the, if the court dismissed the case for just by saying effectively that these litigants aren't the right people, then they would just delay. And that what happened is one of these other lawsuits, there's lawsuits in Oklahoma, in Indiana, uh, in the District of Columbia, um, and I'm, there's a couple more, I think. One of those other lawsuits would then work its way up and go back up to the Supreme Court, but it would take another you know, year or two years for it to happen. So this administration would be out of office probably by that time. Yes. Well, I would just say one, yeah, I, I'm happy to address that. And I want to make one very broad comment about um, legislation, interpreting legislation, and then I'll address the specifics. And it's funny because right after I'm done talking to you, I've got, I'm going to go to the law school and I'm going to teach a class on statutory interpretation. And so I, I'm teaching that this semester. So this is fun. We're talking about this class, or about this case a little bit. But, you know, there are basically two different ways to think about how to interpret statutes. And what people like Justice Scalia have been saying for years is, that when legislation is passed, it's just basic political science that deals are cut and made in order to get legislation through. That's just how all legislative bodies work, right? Whether it's the state, whether it's the city council or the state, leg uh, state legislature or Congress. And what Justice Scalia has been saying for years is th those deals are reflected in the text of the law. You know, lawmakers actually pay a lot of attention to what they write because they, they bargain for it in order to get it through the legislative process. So it's really wrong of the courts or the executive just to ignore the text in favor of something else because that's what legislators really worked on and bargained for, right? That's just political science 101. It takes compromise over provisions of the law to get it through the legislature. So we ought to enforce those. And then you've got people like Justice Breyer on the Supreme Court who say, oh, no, 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 no. What we ought to enforce is the overarching purpose of the law. And this is what the administration is saying now. Well, the purpose of the law you know, this, oh, this floating in the air thing was to have uh, health care, free, well, free and affordable health care for all Americans and exchanges in all 50 states. And if we enforce this particular provision, even though it's actually in the law, but if we enforce it, it's going to hurt the purpose of the law. So therefore, we should disregard it and enforce the purpose. And this is a long-running debate in our country uh, for years and years now, decades and decades, and I pretty clearly come down on the side of Justice Scalia, and I say if it's in the text and Congress wrote it, you have to enforce it. But then to the specific question about this law, I'm not so sure actually, I don't think this is a typo um, at all, uh, for the reasons I talked about in terms of the cooperative federalism and getting it through the Senate, but also other provisions of the bill. Here's, here's what the bill pretty clearly says. The bill clearly contemplates exchanges in all 50 states. But it clearly gives the federal government authority to set up the exchanges in states that don't cooperate, right? So in that sense, when supporters of the law say, well, my gosh, you can't, you can't possibly ask us to believe that Congress passed a law and they didn't intend Missouri to have an exchange, the answer is, well, of course not. No one thinks that because the federal government was given power to set up the exchange. That's not the question. The question is, what would happen in that state if the federal government and not the state ran the exchange? That's the question. And to that question, the law is pretty clear, and it says federal premium assistance isn't available. Again, because that was the little incentive. That was the carrot that the government was dangling in front of the states. So if you look at the law as a whole, I think it actually, um, when you understand it as a federal cooperative federalism law, it, it works pretty well. So there, there, people do make arguments about you know, the law, the holistic purpose of the act will be harmed. Um, I just don't see it when you actually look at the way these provisions fit together. Now, did the administration expect this to happen? No, of course not. Would they have drafted it this way if they knew 34 states were going to turn them down? I, I doubt it, you know. But tough. I mean, that's democracy, right? Go change it then. I mean, that's the answer. If you don't like it, pass another law. Pass another law. Yes, sir.
Well, um, the Hobby Lobby case um, was a was a unique privilege to be to be part of. Um, uh, to serve, I served as co-counsel in that case, and that was a, hu a huge privilege for me. And the thing about the, the Hobby Lobby case is it's, it has a lot of parallels to this current case because the administration, in many ways, was trying to do the same thing. Hobby Lobby was also about a rule, an interpretive rule, uh, that required business owners to pay for all these drugs and devices, including ones that violated their their faith convictions. Congress didn't actually write that in the bill. You can go look in the Affordable Care Act, and you won't find what the fight in Hobby Lobby was about. You won't find that in the Affordable Care Act. The administration issued that rule later. The difference was in that case, everybody agreed they had authority to issue that rule because Congress explicitly said to the administration, you make up the rules as to what businesses have to provide. And they did, and they made up you know, terrible rules, and they didn't include any religious exemption. So uh, you know, your point's a great one. Ultimately, whether it's about the separation of powers and federalism or religious liberty, what we're fighting for here are our liberties, our, our traditional constitutional liberties for our communities and individuals. And those liberties are at stake in this case, in this Obamacare case. Why? Because if this law is enforced as it's written, you shouldn't have to purchase insurance that, that Obama approves in this state. And employers shouldn't have to offer Obama-approved Obama insurance in this state, right? With Hobby Lobby, what was at stake there was the individual liberty of free conscience and exercise of religion. And it was a huge precedent in terms of what the court was, I'm sorry, what the Obama administration was trying to do in that case was force business owners to violate their conscience. And at the end of the day, what the Obama administration claimed was, if you get into business in this country, the federal government can tell you what your moral convictions ought to be. So if you want to run a business, you're going to agree with the following moral convictions or you're not going to run the business which is an unprecedented thing in American history for the gov federal government, any government, but especially the federal government, to tell American business people, which is why that case, in my mind, was so, so significant. So I'm hoping that the United States Supreme Court, which drew the line in the Hobby Lobby case in our favor, I'm hoping that this will be the next installment, you know, that this will be the sequel to Hobby Lobby. And they will say, you know, just as the government can't trample people's individual liberties, the president can't trample the separation of powers and federalism. And those things together, whether it's our Bill of Rights, liberties, or separation of power and federalism, the whole point is to protect freedom and individual liberty in this country. So I think the cases really do fit together. Okay, one more. Yeah, go ahead. The law is so huge and has so many different provisions Various things, like the exchanges will still exist because the federal government's running our exchange. So that'll still be up and running. Insurers will still have to comply. You know, they'll still have to um, uh, offer Obama-approved insurance on the exchanges. So th what, will, what will really happen immediately is confusion. I mean, there will be, uh, there will be a huge questions about what exactly businesses are required to do, what insurers are required to do, how the exchanges will operate. And this is... Some people complain about this. The administration's complaining about it. They're forecasting the end of the world as we know it. Western civilization is going to end the day the Supreme Court <laughs> enforces the president's own law, right? Which, of course, is what we've been saying for years. But this is what they're saying is going to happen. <coughs> to which my response is, you know, that's what the democratic process is for. And that's a good thing because it will force the president to come back to the bargaining table and to uh, hammer out a new law, a new compromise, because his, his law will be mortally wounded. So the, the answer is, Bob, I don't know, actually. I don't know. Um, and, I'm not, and I think that uncertainty is not a bad thing. Thank you.